So we're going to take uh, a slightly different uh, angle to this and actually show you some in the trenches work that people like myself are doing at Rubric and other companies here locally on employing machine learning to take a much more engineering approach to antibody discovery and use computational methods to address some key problems in antibody, therapeutic antibody discovery. So we'll start off with our machine learning scientist, Alex, Dr. Alex Taguchi at Rubric, and uh, he's been phenomenal to work with, and he's gonna talk about how do we address the problem of hitting difficult epitopes in early stage antibody discovery and show some of his work there. And then following Alex will be uh, Sridhar Govindarajan, who's co-founder and CIO at Atom, a uh, local company here. And he's gonna talk about how does he use synthetic biology machine learning to engineer these therapeutic antibodies. Okay, thanks Matt. But thanks, Matt. I'll be introducing our antibody discovery platform where we can take a target with a desired therapeutic epitope, like that shown in gold on the screen, and discover antibodies that bind specifically to that epitope of interest. Great. So one of the big problems we have with the world of antibody discovery is that we're running out of the conventionally easier targets to go after. To illustrate this point, out of the roughly 80 approved antibodies, nearly one third of them shown on the screen, are going after the same group of five targets. And we've been narrowly focused on this small subset of the target space despite this vast number of untapped opportunities that have been validated by small molecule therapeutics. And what this says to me is that clearly the current state of antibody discovery technology is insufficient to effectively or efficiently go after these more challenging targets. That's what we want to do at Rubric Therapeutics. But in order to understand how to go after these more challenging targets, we first have to understand what is it that makes these challenging targets so difficult in the first place. And for many of these targets, that has to do with something called immunodominance. In a protein, there will be certain regions, like those shown in red here, which have a higher natural propensity to bind antibodies or elicit a stronger immune response. And these are called immunodominant sites on a protein. Conversely, you also have sites on a protein that will have a naturally weaker ability to bind antibodies, and these are called subdominant sites. Now, if your therapeutic epitope of interest happens to be a dominant epitope, like that shown in red, well, then you're in luck. The conventional antibody discovery technologies will get you many antibody hits for the therapeutic epitope you're interested in. If, on the other hand, your therapeutic epitope happens to be a subdominant site, then the conventional strategies will generate few to no antibody hits. And so what we want to do is develop a platform giving us control over where our antibodies bind to our target, regardless of whether or not it's at a dominant or subdominant site, thus overcoming the problem of immunodominance. So we started with a simple hypothesis. What if from the target protein on the left here, you could snip out this gold epitope and engineer in some small scaffold, which we're using at Alpha Helix here, to stabilize the sequence structure and motion of that desired epitope we want to highlight. Then you would have this small miniaturized antigen molecule, which we call MEMS here at Rubric, which presents the epitope we're interested in, but doesn't carry along with it all that extra baggage of the immunodominant sites from the target protein. Then you could imagine using that for antibody discovery and circumvent immunodominance by not presenting those immunodominant sites that would have masked that subdominant site in the first place. So how do we build these MEM molecules? Well, computational modeling technologies have matured significantly over the past decades, but we're still not at the point where we can screen the full space of possible scaffold sequences that might stabilize this epitope. So that will just take way too long, so we're gonna use an artificial intelligence approach to accelerate this process. So instead of a brute force search, we take a small sampling from that space of possible scaffold sequences, run molecular simulations on them, and use those to train a machine learning algorithm to predict what it thinks is gonna be the best stabilizing scaffold for our epitope we're trying to present. Now, it's not gonna do a very good job at first, 
But the point is now it has the opportunity to learn from its mistakes and iteratively predict and learn, predict and learn, autonomously driving our molecular simulation process until it starts coming up with pretty reasonable looking predictions, like that shown here. This molecule in particular would have taken more than a year to generate had we tried to screen the entire space of possible scaffold sequences, but with our artificial intelligence accelerated approach, this process turned out to be only about on the order of a day or two. So then the next question with this technology is, how do we know which epitope is the right epitope to go after? And we don't. I, in fact, I would argue that nobody knows. It's a very difficult or impossible problem to try and predict where the efficacious epitope or therapeutically most relevant epitope is going to be on an engine you're trying to design an antibody for. So that's why we just build MEM molecules, actually multiple MEM molecules per epitope site for full target coverage, not throwing our eggs in just one basket. So now that we have these MEM molecules, how do we use them to pull out antibodies that are specific to our epitope of interest? We do this via a in vitro selection where we use our uh, MEMs right up front at round one. Starting from our antibody library of tens of billions of clones, we pull out those tens of thousands of clones that have a propensity to bind our epitope as presented by our MEM molecule. Then we add a layer of stringency in round two with a full length target where we find those thousands of clones that bind specifically to our full length target. We can add further layers of stringency if we like to in the further rounds. Uh, here we're showing, for example, cells expressing our full length target to find those roughly hundreds of on epitope antibody hits that we typically get. And what's important to note here is that we've avoided the immunodominance problem right up front at round one by not allowing any of those clones through from the original antibody library that would have bound to those immunodominant sites on the full length target thanks to our MEM filter. So then you might be wondering, well, that's a great idea, but does any of it work? So we tested this on an internal campaign with CD25 where the goal is to discover an antibody with ADCC activity for CD25, but doesn't interfere with the mode of binding between CD25 and its protein partner, IL-2. And we targeted these eight epitopes as being potential candidates for an antibody that could suffice for that purpose. So we ran those eight epitopes through our MEM campaign program. And then the next question is, well, how do you know where they're binding? How do you know if they're actually binding to the epitope you intended them to bind to? Well, we did a four competitor cross-blocking study where one of the competitors was IL-2 and the remaining three competitors were antibodies with known binding locations on CD25. So with that cross-blocking profile, we can begin to triangulate where our antibody roughly bound to our protein. And we found that roughly 80% of our mem seared hits were binding on epitope or consistent with these cross-blocking profiles. Interestingly, if you were to do the same sort of in vitro screening assay, but using uh, three rounds of conventional CD25 antibody selection, just using the CD25 protein as the bait, then you end up with 90% of your antibody hits binding at that CD25 IL-2 interface. Now, why is that? That's because that's where the dominant epitopes are, and those are the epitopes we've avoided with our MEM campaign. We've also corroborated these results with uh, orthogonal alanine scan mutations, which also show and are consistent with roughly 80% of our MEMs are binding on their intended epitope. So then we have to ask, all right, well, how well did we achieve our original goal of steering those epitope hits or antibody hits away from that interface? Again, with the uh, conventional strategy, we get most of our hits binding at that CD25 IL-2 interface because of the dominant epitope there. But with the MEM program selection, that ratio gets flipped on its head, and we end up seeing most of our antibody hits being the desired IL-2 non-blockers. So we're also not sacrificing anything in terms of our antibody hits uh, affinities and sequence diversities that are coming out of our MEM campaigns. On the left, you see uh, the affinities of our MEM programs, of our antibodies are uh, roughly the same as what you get from uh, conventional antibody selection approaches. And then on the right, we did a cluster analysis of the sequences that came out of our individual MEM campaigns and showed that we are still getting uh, significant sequence diversity. So then what's the, the next important question is, 
do these things have ADCC activity? And when we took uh, and converted from SCFV format to IgG format, the most promising leads, we found that many of them had ADCC activity equal to or even better than the current benchmarks, the current state of the art. And this is remarkable because we haven't even started optimizing these hits yet. And what this tells us is that it's far more important to discover an antibody that hits the right epitope than it is to take an antibody for a suboptimal epitope and to try and optimize from there. We can then map this data back onto the actual structure of CD25. So this is an actual ADCC functional mapping onto CD25, and we've discovered two hotspots, which we can now go after for further optimization purposes. So in summary, our mem-programmed selection produces hit clones that are on epitope, and at least compared to the uh, conventional strategies, they deliver high affinity sequence diverse clones, and in many cases can deliver higher than benchmark ADCC activity without optimization because we have exquisite control over where our antibodies are, are binding to the antigen target. So in just the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about the future direction of rubric. We want to now move towards more complex, challenging problems, which are more high value. And the one we've been eyeing right now is the GPCR family, because in this family, there's a dominant intracellular domain, as well as a immunodominant N terminus at the extracellular domain. And these mask our ability with conventional antibody approaches to discover antibodies that bind at the subdominant extracellular loops, which are implicated in modulating GPCR activity. So we're taking a similar approach with uh, just generating certain mem baits that represent in a small antigen format our GPCR. But GPCRs are pretty big, so we've taken a divide and conquer approach where we take the individual modules, three modules of the GPCR, uh, redesign the scaffolds for those three components, recombine that solution, and this is one example of the GPCR baits we're pulling out that uh, present those ECL2, ECL1, 2, 3, and 4 loops for antibody discovery. And um, we've actually expressed this with the help of uh, Adam, who's going to be presenting next, and I'm happy to report that these baits are showing binding affinity to the natural ligands, and so we're now simultaneously optimizing these designs and moving forward with the most promising designs for antibody discovery purposes. And I want to thank the full contributing team at Rubric, Computational Discovery and Biology team, and especially Matt Grieving and Isaac Bright, our co-founding CTO and CEO. And um, I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>